Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the third talk in the JS Bootcamp series for 2012. Uh, my name is Ryan Blunden, and today I'm going to be talking to you about DOM scripting. Uh, and, and also, this uh, video is being recorded as well and will be hosted on, uh, on YouTube. Okay, so the goals of this talk. Uh, so by the end, I'd like you to understand what the DOM is, uh, be familiar with APIs for traversing and manipulation, have an awareness of performance considerations, and be able to debug and experiment with the DOM as well. Okay, so how are we going to achieve that? First off, we're going to cover exactly what the DOM is and then what DOM scripting is. Uh, we'll talk about some of the cross-browser issues you run into uh, when you try and use native DOM methods. Uh, we talk about accessing the DOM, uh, traversing the DOM, manipulating it, uh, and then some, uh, some key considerations for performance as well. Uh, and then just to finish off, we'll, we'll do uh, a tiny little bit of debugging with the DOM using some, uh, some developer tools in the browser. Okay, uh, so this uh, presentation is just a HTML file uh, and all of the code samples in here you can actually execute uh, in the context of this page uh, so you can see what's going on. Uh, also, I use console.assert uh, as more of a test-driven way to make sure that the code uh, that I'm using in console actually does what I expect it to do. And uh, if you ever, if you know, hopefully after this you start experimenting uh, in the browser yourself, I'd encourage you to use uh, console.assert to, to use that test-driven methodology as well. Okay, so first of all, let's just talk about the document object model. Um, so it's essentially an API for HTML and XML documents. Uh, the way I like to think of it is it's like an in-browser database that has terrible write and terrible read performance. So the idea is to interact with it as little as possible. Uh, the Mozilla's uh, developer network is uh, a really great website uh, that has excellent quality content uh, and there's a useful link there which, which uh, can give you more detail on some of the topics I'll cover today. Uh, so DOM scripting, well DOM scripting refers to programmatically accessing uh, the DOM and we usually do this via JavaScript. Uh, for JavaScript the DOM is accessed via the document object uh, which is attached to the global window object. All right, this is uh, a sample DOM tree. So the root node you can see there is document and extending from document we have the head of the document and the body of the document. So the head is where we find meta tags, the title of the page, perhaps some CSS uh, and then in the body uh, we can see we've got a H1, a heading one, a paragraph tag uh, and the yellow boxes there, um, uh, like for instance if we look at the head in title, uh, title has a text node, which is its value, which might be in a hello world or something like that. And then for a script tag, it might have a source attribute. Now the interesting thing is that everything in the DOM is a node, regardless of whether it's an attribute, whether it's text in a tag, everything is a node. Okay, um, can you guys see that okay? That, is that coded, yep? All right, so that is exactly the same as that picture I just showed. So we can see we've got a head tag with a title and a script tag and then in the body tag we have a h1 followed by a paragraph which has a class of summary and two list items. Yeah. So uh, in your previous slide um, it shows that head, title and script are siblings. So yes. Why are they siblings when the head is also a uh, That's actually, yeah, that shouldn't, that's an uh, uh, issue with the um, picture. So. Head title and uh, script aren't siblings. Sorry, the way it is is that um, head uh, title and script are children of head element. So yeah, cool. All right, so DOM nodes and DOM elements. Uh, a DOM node is anything in the DOM tree, as I said before. So it can be an element, an element attribute. Uh, it can even be a HTML comment or even white space. Uh, so this can create issues if you're using native DOM uh, methods to, to iterate over elements. Uh, but I'll get into that a bit later. Okay, so uh, an element, uh, as opposed to a DOM node, is simply an object that represents a type of HTML element. So it might be an image element, it might be a div element, uh, and it's important to make the distinction because 
you can have an element, like if you look at the code sample uh, down the bottom of the slide, you can have an image element that's just sitting basically in memory. It only becomes a DOM node when you actually insert it into, say, you know, the body. Uh, so the question was, are uh, all nodes elements? Uh, no. So you can have nodes that might just be a HTML comment or a text or white space or something like that. Uh, yeah, OK. So node information. Um, this, is particular, this pertains to elements. But some things that you'll want to interrogate about an element are its node name. So if you're iterating over something and you're not sure what you're iterating over, uh, you can analyze its node name property, which will return whether it's, say, like an image or a paragraph element. And then the element.node type property is also useful because it'll tell you what type of, uh, of node um, something is. So it could, so for instance, if you're iterating over a series of nodes, you can then find out, is this node that I'm iterating over white space? Is it a HTML comment or is it an element? And so uh, looking at that example there, uh, the element uh, has a node type of one. Okay, so DOM scripting and cross-browser issues. Uh, Pete, who did a presentation last week about DOM events, touched on some of this. Uh, and for DOM scripting, uh, there are also lots of cross-browser issues, unfortunately. Uh, just a couple examples, uh, detecting when the DOM is actually ready uh, and getting and setting uh, attributes. Uh, another, another thing to touch on which is really important uh, for performance is there are, there are two events that we can listen on which tell us when we can actually interact with the DOM. Uh, one is DOM ready and the other is window on load. So the window.onload event will fire once absolutely everything has been downloaded. So that's images, that's CSS files, that's JavaScripts, that's everything. Now we can wait till then, but a lot of the time what we want to do is we want to start interacting and decorating the DOM um, adding useful JavaScript features as soon as the DOM has been built. And that's why we listen for the DOM ready um, event instead. Uh, there's no reliable cross browser way to do this, so that's why we rely on uh, other libraries to fire that event and then we, we listen for that event. Okay, so I talked about abstraction libraries. Uh, the main ones that we use for web development are Sizzle, uh, YUI, jQuery, and Zepto.js. So currently, we use Sizzle um, as our DOM selector engine um, because it's faster than the one that YUI provides. Uh, at the moment, we're currently transitioning from YUI to jQuery, uh, and that'll continue to happen throughout the year. And for our mobile sites, so the iPhone uh, app and the iPad app, uh, we use Zepto.js, which is, which is similar to jQuery, but it's a slimmed down version um, that tailors uh, for using uh, WebKit browsers, basically. It doesn't have all the cross-browser stuff for, say, Internet Explorer that jQuery has. So it's just a lighter weight version. OK, uh, so I'm not, as a result, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the native um, browser methods for interacting with the DOM because we don't, we don't use them. Uh, but if you do want to have a look, and I encourage you just to explore, uh, there's a couple of code samples up there. So console.dir will uh, basically print out the object um, that is the document object, and then you can start interrogating that uh, in the browser to see what some of the properties, uh, see some of the properties that it has. So I'll just show you how you might want to go about that. Ooh. Okay, this is Firefox, so maybe I won't. But uh, T take my word for it, if you, uh, if you run something like Safari, uh, then you'll be able to throw these commands straight into the, into the console and uh, you'll be able to see how they work. Okay, so accessing the DOM. Uh, so I mentioned, very important, you've got to wait till the DOM is ready. Uh, in this example, uh, we just have code which uh, once the DOM ready event has fired, it calls the initialize method on our window.app object. And you can see the differences in the code there for Yahoo as opposed to jQuery. OK, so finding DOM nodes, pretty important. Uh, so with Sizzle or jQuery selector engines, you can virtually use um, all CSS 1 to 3 selectors, uh, which is really powerful and it's really flexible. Um, but you've got to be smart about how you do it uh, in order to uh, maximize performance. Um, 
So I've got a link uh, on this slide which goes into a great amount of detail about how to make sure the selectors you're using are performant. Uh, okay, so at the moment uh, we use Sizzle as I mentioned before and that's alias to Y dollar. So here we have some examples. Um, when we search for something like say uh, an article element, it returns us an array. So we can see there that we can query uh, the length of, like how many articles were returned. Uh, we can do things like target an article that has a class of fill. That's the, the third sample there. Uh, we can grab the first article in a list of articles. Uh, and we can also, if you want to check to see like if an element exists or not, then just check that the uh, node list that you return back is zero. No elements found. Uh, yes? Okay, so the question is when would you use say Sizzle over jQuery? Um, the answer is you wouldn't, but the reason why um, we're using Sizzle is just because YUI's um, DOM selector engine is quite slow compared to Sizzle, uh, but once the transition has been made to jQuery, then we don't need Sizzle anymore either. jQuery selector engine is sufficiently fast. Okay, so nodes and node lists. Uh, so as I said, Sizzle and jQuery return a list of nodes. Uh, now YUI and jQuery's DOM API methods, they allow you to basically use their API to apply changes, like say changing the style of something, um, across the entire node list. So in this example, we have a list of articles. And uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to set the opacity of all of those articles to 0.5. Uh, and then the third uh, piece of code there using jQuery just changes the opacity back to one. Uh, what you can do if you just want a single node, um, a node list is just an array, and so you say I want the you know, index at zero if you want the first, or if you want the second then the index would be one, and you simply take that out and then you're dealing with a native DOM element at that point. Okay, so applying the jQuery and YUI API to individual nodes. Uh, so yeah, sometimes you'll, you'll extract a single node, but you still want that nice API. Uh, so all you do is you just need to, like we did before uh, in the last slide, wrap um, the call uh, around that element. So if we look at the Yahoo example, uh, yahoo.util.dom.add class uh, it takes the DOM element as the first argument, and then the class that we want to add as the second argument. And jQuery does something pr pretty similar. You wrap the element that you want to change uh, in a jQuery call, and then you tack on the API um, that you want to use afterwards. Okay, so getting and setting attributes. This is something that we do uh, a lot of, and is one of the biggest areas where the browsers don't quite agree. Uh, okay, so in this, in these examples. Um, we're going to use YUI to interrogate a data attribute. Now, like one thing that's interesting is that the different frameworks differ in, in how they try and help you out or, or the attributes that they, they give you back. So for example, um, the attribute of data slide uh, index, uh, if we try and grab that via uh, Yahoo's um, DOM utility method, it'll give us back a string of one. If we do this via jQuery, jQuery tries to be smart and says, hey, this looks like an integer, I'm going to give you back an integer instead. So if you're using Yahoo or if you, YUI or if you're using jQuery, just make sure like, you know exactly what type of, um, of value you're getting back when you, when you call a method to get something. Otherwise, uh, if we want to set something, it's pretty easy. Uh, the examples for Yahoo and jQuery are pretty similar. It's essentially saying I want to specify, this is the element I want to change, this is the name of the attribute that I want to alter, and then this is the value um, that I want to set it to. Uh, so HTML5 introduced something called data attributes, and it's basically a way for us uh, to store state or values uh, for an element that don't actually affect uh, its presentation at all. Uh, and jQuery in particular handles this really, really well. Uh, so the slide that you can see there with the image, uh, we have several data attributes there. And what we do when we call jQuery, when we get a reference to this element, is we can call a method called data. 
What data does is it'll collect all of those data attributes for us, put it into a nice little object and return that to us. So then we can do things like uh, cat data, just dot ID or cat data dot category. So jQuery makes it really easy to work with data attributes. Okay, so traversing the DOM. It's basically a family tree. If you've worked with uh, a document object model in another language, like say XML, this should all be pretty familiar to you, uh, with perhaps the exception of a property called inner HTML, which we'll get to a bit later. But essentially, it's, uh, it's an API for climbing up, down, and across a tree. Now, when you traverse, you can either do it like one step at a time. So you might go, you might have an element here and you might go to its parent, uh, or you might go to its sibling. Or if you're using something like YUI or jQuery, then you have more tools at your disposal to, uh, to, to filter you know, by exactly where you want to go, um, up or down or across. Uh, traversing down is always easy because it's just a direct filtering process of where you are right now. OK, so native DOM traversing. Uh, I mentioned before that anything in the DOM tree is in fact a node. And that's why using the native API for DOM traversing can be a bit surprising. So in these code samples, uh, we get a reference to uh, a list item. We interrogate its parent element, which is a UL. Uh, then we get a reference to a paragraph element. And then for this particular HTML code, we have to, if we want to see what its next sibling is, which in this example would be a footer tag, we have to call next sibling twice. And that's because naturally there's probably going to be some white space between the paragraph element and that footer element. So when you're using these type of methods, you have to be really careful. Uh, that's why a lot of the abstraction libraries, when they iterate, say, over a series of elements, they're, they're making checks every time they iterate over a node to say, OK, is this an element? If it's not, OK, I need to keep going. OK, so traversing the DOM with YUI. So it does provide methods for searching for siblings, ancestors, and children. Uh, but what it does, it tries to keep it along the lines of the native API that the browser already provides. Um, this, is, this is commendable, but unfortunately, it doesn't quite make the APIs flexible and uh, easy to use and efficient as, as something like jQuery. Uh, but that, that's just their philosophy. Uh, so in this example, we can see that we're targeting uh, an article element with a class of uh, first article. Uh, and then inside that, we're targeting the first li list item that we find. Uh, what we then want to do is we want to jump to um, the article, like the, the parent of the li. Uh, and then we're going to look for a p element inside that. And then we want to see what the next, next sibling is. So what I was doing when I, when I was thinking when I was doing this is just creating some sort of test uh, some sort of like gymnastics for um, the library to go through to see how complicated it would be to do it. And that's not too bad. Like four lines of code, that's, that's pretty reasonable. jQuery though just makes it so easy. Uh, one is because uh, they, have, they have chaining. Uh, and as you can see there, we can do everything that we just did before, but we can do it in one line of code. Um, so, and I think one of the reasons why jQuery initially had a rapid, uh, you know, uptake when, when people started looking at it uh, was because uh, it did chaining very well. I mean, chaining isn't something that jQuery only does. Chaining is just JavaScript, but it was something that no other library had really done so much of before. And plus, jQuery focused on providing an excellent and really user-friendly API, which is important when you're writing code against it every day. OK, so iterating over a node list. Uh, so iterating over a node list is much like iterating over a standard array. Um, and the reason why I say much like is because de depending on whether you're using sizzle or jQuery, uh, sizzle will give you back a JavaScript array. It is an exact array. Uh, however, jQuery will give you something that acts like an array but doesn't, that isn't actually a true array. So it has a length property, allows you to iterate over it. Um, you can use the square brackets to gain access to elements in it, but it doesn't have pop and shift and all of those kind of other methods that, that an array actually has. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of. Um, so what changes uh, when we iterate over these DOM uh, node lists is the methods that we can call. Um, so for instance, in this example, 
we get a list of articles. Uh, so because we're using sizzle in the first example, there's just a statement there which says, okay, is this an instance of an array? And of course we expect it to be true, which it is. Uh, and then we iterate over that, and all we're doing is we're going to add a class to every article in this list, which is article dash and then the index that we're currently at. Uh, jQuery's syntax is, is similar. So um, one, like one warning there is that you really shouldn't be like manually iterating over a list of DOM elements unless there's something that unique that you need to do to like every single element. Otherwise, you can just apply something to the node list as a whole. Okay, so manipulating the DOM. Uh, you can build a DOM structure essentially one of two ways. Uh, programmatically, node by node, which when we, you know, when we were doing web development a while ago, that was considered best practice. Or we can take an entire HTML string uh, and we can give that to the browser to pass, sort out, and, uh, and construct the DOM itself. Uh, studies, tests that people have done have actually shown that um, inserting a big chunk of HTML is actually faster. And because the browser manufacturers realize that this is what the web development community at large was doing, they optimize for this use case as well. So while using uh, a DOM, you know, DOM node by node methodology is perhaps considered more purist and more correct, um, it's, it's pragmatic in my experience just to use in a HTML. Okay. But the thing is that building the DOM programmatically uh, still can teach us some useful lessons uh, about how we can do things efficiently. So in this example, uh, we define a container, then we create a div, we create a paragraph element, and then we create a text node. So we kind of, we create everything that we need. Then the next step is to kind of put this all together. So we append the text node to our paragraph element, we append the paragraph element to our div, and then we append the div to our container. And then the code below that uh, is just um, having a look at the HTML that's actually created. We see there that um, our text node, dot node value, we can just change that, which is great because we don't, every time we want to say change the value of a piece of text, we don't necessarily need to rebuild the DOM every time. We have a reference to the text node that is inside the paragraph element. We change that text node and the change is reflected upon the page. So that is a really useful concept uh, that, we, that we still use in web development all the time. But this syntax is a little bit verbose. Yeah. The order that you do the change by like, child, does it matter? Like, you created everything before adding it into the actual DOM. Is that necessary? Yeah, so the question was, does the order matter in which I uh, basically append things and uh, get them working? No, it doesn't. So you can, you can append things after the fact. You can insert it into the DOM and then add things. It doesn't matter. Okay, so building the DOM within a HTML. So we still want to retain some of the concepts that we, we learnt in terms of having references to things and being able to change them so we don't have to rebuild the DOM structure every time, but we want to do it with less code. And that's essentially what inner HTML gives us. Uh, and this, in this code sample, I, I use jQuery as well. Okay, so much like the sample before, we start with a container except instead of having those steps of having to define the elements and the text nodes, now we can just say the container, here is a big chunk of HTML, go create some DOM nodes out of it. Uh, and then we can see there uh, also um, the jQuery container.find uh, p uh, line of code. This is also great because where before uh, in the previous example, we created uh, a text node for P. Now that's fine if all we want to do is put text inside of a, the paragraph, but what if we want to then add some HTML elements? Well, we have to go through the process of perhaps defining an unordered list, define a list, attach that list to the UL, and then append that to the P. When we're using inner HTML, it's just really easy just to once again throw in a block of HTML, and as long as it's well formed, uh, the browser will be able to parse that and create the DOM nodes for us uh, very quickly. So you can see there that uh, we, we do save a lot of lines of code. Yes? Uh, in the example you just had of um, container.inner.html for all that overwrites whatever uh, HTML would have previously been at that point. 
Yeah, so the question was, using an HTML, does that overwrite anything that would have been uh, inside that element at that point? And yes, yeah, it does. Okay, so I've kind of shown you lots of tidbits, uh, but I wanted to show you, I guess, something that more mirrors um, code that we write every day. Uh, there's quite a lot of code, so I'll just step through this bit by bit. Um, so the what this does is it requests some JSON from the server, and then we're just going to render some HTML in the page. So we create uh, essentially an API for our app inside an object because we don't want to pollute the global namespace. We have an initialize phase, a request languages call, which actually gets the data from the server. Uh, and don't, don't worry about that Ajax call. It's, it's just there because it has to work, obviously. And then the guts of the, uh, the app, which is actually the render languages function, which takes the, the data from the server and actually puts it into the page. OK, so in initialize, um, what we're going to do is we're going to inject uh, some, some, some container code for our app uh, in a div called sample code container. Uh, and it's going to set up a heading called programming languages used at LinkedIn. And then what we're going to do in initialize, we're going to create a reference to uh, the div that we've inserted in the previous line, LinkedIn Languages app. Uh, and we do this because we're going to be using this every time we want to append or update the languages that we use at LinkedIn for this example. Uh, we don't want to have to find that div and then append to it. So we just want to store that reference and then we can just use that anytime. Uh, another little convention um, that some people use is when you have a variable that is actually a node list of type like a jQuery node list or something like that, you put a dollar sign in front of the variable. Uh, and that's because when you use jQuery selector engine, you also use a dollar sign. So it just kind of lets the programmer know, oh, OK, this isn't necessarily an array or a number or something like that. It's more than likely a jQuery list of nodes. OK, so in request languages, it's pretty basic. It just returns um, a jQuery uh, XHR object. And then inside render languages, this is where all the action happens. So we get the request from the server. And if the request was successful, what we're going to do is we're going to create um, a empty unordered list. And then we're going to iterate through the data returned from the server. Uh, which is just a list of programming languages. And we're going to append to the unordered list just uh, an, ally, an ally element with the, uh, the text inside that, which is just the, the programming language itself. Then once we're done, uh, we're going to remove the current unordered list from the page, if there is one. And we're going to append uh, the new list that we've just created. Probably the most important thing to take away from this slide uh, is that where we define the element and then we iterate through and we append to the element before we insert it into the DOM. This is great because one thing we want to avoid is touching the DOM as much as possible. So the other way that we could have done it is to make the current uh, unordered list that we have in our page empty. And then when we go through the list, we could just attach that to that, uh, the new list item to that existing unordered list every time. But then that's affecting the DOM, which could affect the layout of the page, and a whole bunch of calculations need to be done. And I'll talk about that uh, in a following slide. But yeah, good thing to take away. Batch do your DOM manipulation in code first, and then apply it to the DOM once, you've, once all the work has been done. Okay. Okay. So inner HTML is great because it's really convenient. It allows us to throw a whole bunch of HTML into the browser. But we have to be careful. So first off is preventing XSS attacks. Anytime you're injecting any HTML, it should be escaped, uh, must be escaped. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that you've got to make sure the markup that you're injecting is valid. If you throw invalid markup into the browser via inner HTML, it'll do its best to figure out what it thinks you mean, but it could break the page very, very badly. OK, performance. So I touched on uh, you know, earlier why it's important to kind of batch process uh, your, DOM manip your manipulations to elements before you throw them into the DOM. That's because we want to try and avoid what are called repaints and reflows. 
Okay, so, and depending upon what you're doing with the DOM, one or both may occur. Okay, so a repaint uh, happens when something is made visible that wasn't visible before, or vice versa. Uh, and basically, as a result of that, if something becomes visible, then the document, the browser has to figure out, okay, well, now that's visible, how has that affected things around it? And it has to do a whole bunch of calculations there. Uh, likewise, a reflow. A reflow is going to happen when something in the DOM um, is physically manipulated, like maybe the text changed, maybe you've added a class, maybe you've taken a class away. And so the reason why it's called a reflow is you may have an element at this level and that changes. That's going to affect elements that are around it, it's going to affect elements that are below it, and it's going to affect elements that are next to it. When those elements change, if they have to change or move, then they cause a reflow as well, which affects elements that are near them. So the idea is, is that uh, you manipulate the DOM as little as possible, and when you do manipulate the DOM, you manipulate the DOM uh, uh, in as low a level as possible. So you don't want to be changing things near the body, for instance, because that could cause a reflow all the way down. You want to be as specific as possible when you change things. Um, there's a great article there from Nicole Sullivan which further explains uh, about repaints and, uh, and reflows, and that's probably one of the most important slides uh, in the talk, uh, particularly since a lot of you will end up doing JavaScript um, that's running on mobile devices. This performance stuff becomes incredibly important when, when you start uh, yeah, doing things on mobile. Okay, some other performance tips. If there's a, a DOM uh, element that you're going to be updating a lot or referencing a lot, cache a reference to it. It'll save some time. Uh, and as I've said many times before, interface with the DOM just as little as possible. And Paul Irish has a great talk there uh, about how you can get the best performance uh, using HTML5 and CSS3 and JavaScript together. Okay, so we've got a debugging talk coming up uh, tomorrow. But uh, I just wanted to briefly mention um, debugging with the DOM with WebKit developer tools. So when you're changing um, the DOM, it's really useful to use uh, a de some developer tools to see visually what's going on. Uh, personally, I prefer the WebKit developer tools that are in Chrome and Safari. Uh, and there's a great presentation on how to get the most out of those. Uh, and what I've found uh, is that I actually use these developer tools as a development environment, not just for debugging. So to, depending on how you, you like to code, this, this may not suit you, uh, but particularly in the, uh, the nightly build version of Chrome, which is Google um, Chrome Canary, they're putting some incredible features in, uh, like tabbed, uh, tab display for different files. You can hit Command-O and it'll search all the files on the page so you can edit them in place. Um, it's got syntax highlighting. It even recognizes when, for instance, if you're doing CSS, and uh, the color, you know, uh, you might have done something wrong. It won't, you know, color highlight that section. It's really, really awesome. Um, but, you know, the developer tools in Firefox, Internet Explorer 10, and Opera are good too. Uh, main thing is you're going to need some sort of development um, tool in the browser to help you when you're debugging uh, any issues in the DOM. All right, so uh, that's the uh, end of the presentation. Is there uh, any questions? If you just want to step up to the mic. Hello. Uh, do you know of any uh, developer tools for uh, mobile? For mobile? Yeah. Uh, right, so yeah, there is a couple. Uh, Winery is one um, that we use that enables you to basically uh, look at the version of Safari that might be running um, in, a, in a native app. Uh, iWeb Inspector is also really good. So it's one that emulates the Chrome developer tools, uh, but you can use, once again, to bit to debug mobile Safari. Uh, and I think I was reading something this morning that in iOS 6, Apple have actually released some form of officially supported tool for helping to debug uh, mobile Safari, uh, which is great news, because, yeah, it is, it is really difficult at the moment. Great. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.